Welcome to the third lecture on the visualization of graphs. Today we want to talk about force-directed drawing algorithms. Those are physics-based algorithms that can draw any graph for you, not only planar, but any graph. And it can get quite good drawings most of the time. So we want to have a look at the general algorithm framework first, and for that we want to recall what was the general layout problem from the first lecture? The input for us is just some abstract graph and the output shall be some clear and readable drawing of G and here we only want straight line drawings now. And we had a bunch of optimization criteria. We had a bunch of drawing aesthetics that we want to do. For example, adjacent vertices should be close in the drawing and non-adjacent vertices should be far apart. We want our edges to be straight line, we want them to be short, and optimally we want them to have similar length. We want that densely connected parts, so-called clusters, form communities. So if we have a bunch of vertices like here that are very closely connected, then we want them to be close in the drawing. And if we have vertices like these and these that don't have much to do with each other, then they should be far away. Of course, we also want to have very few crossings and we want an even distribution of the nodes. Now these are very many drawing aesthetics and we cannot optimize all of them at the same time. In fact, some of these criteria contradict each other. For example, we cannot have an even distribution of the nodes and also have clusters from communities. We cannot have these clusters and also edges of similar length. That doesn't work. So we need something that gives us a good solution. There is no optimum solution here, but we want all these aesthetics and all of them should be somehow satisfied. Before we do that, there's one aspect that I want to focus a bit more on first, which is this similar length part. That's something that we haven't done before. So if we only want to focus on this, then our question looks like the following. We have an abstract graph and for every edge, we have a required edge length. And then the output is a drawing where we realize all the edge lengths. If we have similar length, then probably this is all a one or all a two or something. So you can imagine that you use matches for your edges. You just take a bunch of matches and you want to draw the graph with that. And where these matches meet, there you have a vertex and then automatically all the edges will have the same length. And some graphs we can do quite well in this way. For other graphs there might be drawings, but they can be very ugly. And for other graphs there is no way to do that. In the exercise sheet you will have a look at some of those. This problem is quite hard. Now, in any dimension, if we want to have uniform edge lengths and we want to get some drawing, this is MP hard to find, if we don't care about anything else. If we have planar graphs and we want planar drawings with uniform edge lengths, then this is also MP hard. And it's even hard when the edge lengths can be either a 1 or a 2, so for each of them you can choose if it's a 1 or a 2, even then it's MP hard. So it's very tough to get a drawing that has this criterion where all the edge lengths are some required one, or all of them are the same. But to get a good approximation for this, Peter Eads, in 1984, came up with a physical analogy. He wrote, to embed a graph, we replace the vertices by steel rings, and we replace each edge with a spring to form a mechanical system, like this one here. We have steel rings for the vertices and we have springs for the edges. Then we place the vertices in some random initial layout and let go so that the spring forces on the rings move the system to a minimal energy state like this. And if we model this, then we can get drawings where edges have similar length. How do we model this? We have a bunch of forces in this layout. So every spring gives us an attractive force. If we have two adjacent vertices, U and V, we have a spring between them and that gives us the attractive force between U and V that pulls them together. 
Now, if we only have this kind of force, then that would mean that everything collapses. So we also want these non-neighboring vertices to be far apart. We want for the springs to not only pull, but if the vertices are too close, we also want them to push so that we get to some optimal spring now. So we need also repulsive forces. You can imagine that all the vertices are magnets and they are all negative or all positive. So these vertices push against each other. And this repulsive force we have between every pair of vertices. And with just these two different types of forces, you can create a bunch of different algorithms. You just have to define what is my attractive force and what is my repulsive force and then you get a different algorithm. You might even add additional forces to that, but that's not something that we want to do today. And these algorithms are so-called spring embedders or force-directed algorithms. And those are among the most frequently used methods that you do in graph drawing in practice. So whenever you get a graph, it's usually a good idea to just throw it into some force-directed algorithm and then see what happens. And if you are careful in choosing these forces, then you can optimize a bunch of different things. Maybe not optimally, but you can get good solutions. So let's try to formalize how this algorithm looks like with pseudocode. For a force-directed algorithm, the input is some abstract graph. We need some initial layout of the graph, so we need some position for all the vertices, in general, you can just assign random coordinates to those, or you start with some specific layout that you like. And throughout the algorithm, we will update this initial layout until we get to our end layout that we will then return. And then we have two more constant parameters. The first one is the threshold. The threshold epsilon tells us when should we stop. So we recompute the forces in every step, and when the forces get too small so that nothing really changes anymore, so the forces get below this epsilon, then we stop the algorithm. And the second tells us the maximum number of iterations. So even if the forces are still large, if, say, after a million iterations, we just stop. So these are two parameters to just make sure that our, our algorithm terminates. Now for the algorithm, we have one loop. We count the number of iterations that we had in t, and as long as we have done fewer than k iterations, and the maximum force that we have computed in the previous step is at least epsilon, we continue. And during this loop, we just compute these two different kind of forces that we had. For every vertex, we compute the force on this vertex in step t. And that force we compute by computing the repulsive force to every other vertex and the attractive force to adjacent vertices. And if we add these together, then we get the force that we have on u. We compute that force for every single vertex. And only after we computed it, we apply it to the vertices. So we take their position and we add this force to them, which will move the vertex u, for example, up here. It's important that we first compute it for everybody and only then move it, because otherwise moving u too early might already have an influence on the force on the adjacent vertices and also on the other vertices by these repulsive forces. This one more thing you might notice, we have this delta of t here. And this is the so-called cooling factor. With that cooling factor, we want to make sure that the forces become lower throughout the algorithm. So imagine you have some layout, and in every step it jumps between just two positions. Then you would never stop until you get to the maximum number of iterations. But if you cool down the forces, then those two vertices might come closer to each other. And in general, such a cooling function looks like this. You start with a 1, and then it gets smaller and smaller until you get very close to 0. But you can also just say that this delta is always a 1, and then you don't have any cooling at all. That's up to the choice for your algorithm. And then, if we apply the cooling factor here, 
you would not move up to this point, but for example if delta of t is a 0.5, it only moves to the middle. And that's the whole framework that we need. Basically all the force directed algorithms look like this. It might be that at some points you add a few more forces, but this is the general layout. And in the next part we want to have a look at two implementations of this force directed algorithm. First the one by Eads, who came up with a spring analogy, and then a variant by Fruchtemann and Reingold.